Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to our session on Informer 5 training. We are going to be talking about data sets. Some things we're going to be talking about today will be what is a data set, how we can create data sets, different ways they can be created, and then how you can interact with them once you've got them created. Um, we'll show a little bit of a demonstration there as, as time allows. Discuss a couple of things on architecting data sets, some things to note, things to think about as you're building out data sets. Uh, just a little bit of a refresher about the differences between data sets and ad hoc queries. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. What is a data set definition? A data set is the, the basic building block of informer content. And that can be things like visuals, or reports like dashboards, comparison boards, and data grids. Uh, more formally, a data set is, is actually just an indexed set of records. And those records can come from a number of different sources, such as a query, a text file, or a call to some REST uh, endpoint in some application that returns a structured result set. All of those can then be used to create data sets. Uh, so let's talk about the process of creating a data set. What goes into actually creating one? How do you go about that? Well, there are a, a couple of different ways that you can, can create data sets. We have a data set designer. You can write native SQL. Uh, you can upload files. As we mentioned, the, we can get data from text files into data sets. And then we can also convert ad hoc queries into data sets. The data set designer is uh, built such that users can get in and create data sets using the user-friendly interface without having to know any kind of query language or technical knowledge of, of how to build a query. They're able to point and click and select the data they want to see, add any criteria, uh, build any flow steps into the, the data set that they need. And then Informer generates the actual database query in the back end and executes that on the data source when, when they uh, run the query for the data set. The other option is using native SQL. This gives users more control over the structure of the queries because they're actually either typing in the SQL statement or they're copying and pasting that into the query editor in Informer. And then when they run the query, Informer just executes it as is. There's no manipulation or adjustment done to the query prior to execution. It just ships it off as it's written to the database to be ran. And of course, you would need to know SQL or, or some other whatever query language you're using there to be able to write these kinds of queries. So it's a little more uh, for the technically advanced uh, user. The third option that we mentioned was a file upload. So this allows you to import files with some sort of structured data in them directly into a data set. And those are commonly in the form of a CSV file or an Excel spreadsheet. We also support other structured files like JSON and uh, XML, those kinds of things. Uh, but com most commonly, uh, users import CSV and Excel spreadsheets through this method. And then lastly, we mentioned uh, converting ad hoc queries to data sets. So basically when you have an ad hoc query, you can run that query and then there's an option in the uh, ad hoc query actions menu that allows you to convert that query to a data set. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So we're going to uh, take a moment right now and let's take a look at exactly how this works. What does this look like when you're creating data sets in these uh, four different fashions. So I'm going to toggle over to my browser real quick. Here is in our menu, we're going to our data sets. And creating a data set, we just say new data set, and then we'll, here are our options that we have for creating data sets here. So we have, again, I mentioned the data set designer, the uh, native SQL option, uploading a file, and this uh, fourth option here, you, uh, please ignore that. It's a, a, a feature that I have turned on that adds this little demo database as a list here of, of a data set. Uh, so you can extend this list here through our plugin architecture as shown in this example, but we're just going to be focusing on these first three for right now. So the data set designer, as I mentioned, is intuitive user-friendly interface that allows users to create the data sets not, and not have to know or understand uh, query language necessarily in order to create it. So I'm just going to create a, a simple uh, my data set designer data set. 
And then we'll choose our, our data source. Right here to where did it go? Oh, there it is, right there. Um, and then we'll choose our mapping that we're going to start in, and then click save. So now here we have our query designer, and the query designer. Then I'm able to add fields through a simple interface here. And if you're an Informer 4 user, fairly similar to the field chooser that we had in Informer 4, and in that you see the the main file or main mapping that you're working with in the the data set definition, and then any linked files that you can get to and the linked files within underneath that, underneath those, and then the list of fields that are available in the selected mapping that you uh, have clicked on. So I can just simply add data points just by clicking the add option, or I can double click the column that I want to add and it will add it as well. And again, I can go down to the different files and add stuff that I want from those. Again, I'm just kind of building these, these out here to see what I might want in my data set. And so forth. So I can continue to build that out as I like, and there's a sample of my data set. And then I can manipulate this data set definition just by dragging and dropping columns around if I like. So if I need to reorder things uh, in a different way, I want quantity in front of price. I can also move columns by using the, the context menu here for each column. We have a move option that I can specify where I want this column to appear uh, in the list. And we can also do things like rename the column headers. We can change the formatting, uh, just a number options. If this were a numeric field, then we could change how the number gets displayed, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, uh, most of these are fairly intuitive as to what, what they do. So once I have that, uh, I can add criteria to the data set. You know, if I want to add some sort of selection criteria to limit the data that comes back in my data set, I can add that criteria here. And then I also have my flow steps that I can add, which allows me to derive further values from, from the data that's existing there in the data set. All of our, our flow steps that we have right now, this could actually be an entire day-long session. Uh, and in fact, we're, we're going to have a, a pre-conference workshop uh, for Intrinsicon that goes over flow steps and how to use them and some of the more advanced features there. So uh, if you want more information on that, be sure to register for the, the uh, conference and we'll be going into a deep dive into that in the pre-conference workshop. So now that I have my data set defined, I can save that and then I can run the query and that's actually going to now execute the query. And I've not written any kind of query language or query statement at all. I've just selected the data that I wanted and if I had chosen the criteria, then it would have limited the data that, that came back. Here I have my, my data set now defined. My other data set option was native SQL. So I could actually create a, a data set from a native SQL query. And here, because I'm writing the query myself, I don't have to specify the mapping that I'm starting in. I just need to choose the data source that I'm working in, and then it will bring me to the query editor. So here I could actually start typing in my, my query statement if I wanted to. In this case, I already have one written out just for sake of time, so I'm going to copy and paste one from my other screen over here. And we'll paste that in. So now here's my fully written SQL statement. Uh, so then when I click done, it's going to execute that query for a sample here and give me back a sample of data. So I see everything's working fine there. I can then add flow steps to this as well. So if I want to derive further column values from, from this existing data, I could, or manipulate the data in the existing columns, I could do that through the flow steps. And then again, I can save that and then run the query and it's going to populate the data set then with data. So there's my 
data set populated. The third option we talked about was to upload a file. Now there's a couple ways I can do this. I can either go through this menu option to upload the file and then choose the file and then select it from, from my files here. So I could go to my documents and then go into my folder here and former five. And then I could select the spreadsheet or the CSV file in this case that I wanted to upload and it's going to then upload it and I can save that and creating a data set from it. And there's my, my data set from the file. So if I were to actually open that file up as a in an, in just a regular editor, I'll pull that over here in just a second. So there it is. So there's the actual raw data and now here it is in Informer. I could also uh, just simply drag and drop the file. So I'm going to move this window here down just a little bit, and I can drag and drop this CSV file directly onto Informer, and it will go through the process and import it that way as well. So I don't have to go through the the uh, the UI necessarily to select the file and all of that. I can just drag and drop it straight onto Informer and it will create the data set for me that way too. I can edit this data set and I don't have the ability to do anything beyond as far as changing the, any kind of query or there's no query behind it, it's just the data, raw data uploaded into Informer. I can add flow steps here though, so I can still add my calculations and things that I want to do with flow steps even to this format of data set. And then lastly, I said uh, that we could create a data set from an ad hoc query. So I'm going to jump over here under reports, and we'll be talking more about, specifically about reports in our next session. So here I have basically that same SQL query that I did in the data set, but it is an ad hoc query. And so there's the query statement. And here I have a flow step that's doing a calculation that's taking quantity times price to get this extended amount column here. So if I want to convert that to a data set, I can simply run that ad hoc query. And then once it's done running, I can come up here under actions and say create data set. And then I can name it whatever I want here. And then click save and now it has created an independent data set based on that query definition. So if I edit my query definition for the data set, you'll see the query statement here, and then you also see the calculated column field that came across as well. So it brings over the entire query definition into the data set. And then at that point, I can run that query and populate the data set. So that's another good way that you can create a data set. So once we have the data set populated, there are a lot of different things that we can do with that data. So, you know, again, if you're uh, an Informer 4 user, you kind of know what you can do with report results. Same kind of thing here. You know, you can sort the data. Uh, you can move the columns around. But with data sets, the difference here when I'm, when I'm making these changes is that it remembers those settings. And each time I, I'm viewing this data set, it's going to remember how I organize this data. So if I have it sorted a particular way, columns in a particular order, or anything else that I do with this layout, it's going to remember that for me. Now everybody else continue to see it uh, however they have it defined. So it's almost like user settings, uh, the user settings option in four. You can also group on, on the data. So I can uh, come here and say group, and that's going to group the data. Again, I can add aggregations to that. So if I want to come over here under category, and let's say I want to aggregate a distinct count of that, so I can see each of the different distinct counts there. There's eight distinct categories there. Or I can group on that category and so forth. We can filter the data. So if I want to look at just a particular category, I can come here under my filters and I can 
select a uh, category name and then say do distinct values. There's other ways, we, other types of filters we can do. So if I want to see all of the seafood orders, for example, then there's a list of all the orders that were for seafood. I can add additional filters here as well. So I might want to look at particular regions. So maybe I want to look at all of the seafood orders to New Mexico. So I can filter those out. So now I'm looking at those. And these filters can be saved. So if I want to reuse those at a later time, I can merge these into a single uh, filter and then save it for later use. So then as I, if I come back in later and I want to reference that filter here under Save Filters, I just select it and it will filter the data out for me there automatically. And anyone who has access to this data set would then have access to those Save Filters. We can also do some summarization of the data. So if I want to come here, say for example, under Pivot Tables, I want to create a little summary table, I can very easily come here under Category Name, so I want to uh, analyze or, or do a little summary by category name, and I want to total up the extended amount. So I can see how much, uh, how many sales were made in each of the different categories. I can also add columns to this. So again, I could do say by region, and now it breaks out the data by region, by category with the totals there. If I choose something like a date, so if I'm looking at order date, for example, I can break out the date in the rows by year, and then for the columns, I may want to then look at month to month how I'm doing in each of those years. So we can come here under extended amount and say total. So now it gives me a nice little breakout. All of these cells are interactive, so if I want to look at, for example, all of the June orders here from this particular year, I can just click on that cell, and that's going to give me all of those, uh, all of the data behind that particular cell. These uh, pivot tables can be saved, so I can save these to visuals and use those later, reuse it or, or view it later on. We also have uh, the ability to create visuals here with the Discover tool, and this allows you to very easily create charts and graphs without necessarily having to start from scratch and, and build the visuals from, from ground zero. You can simply select the uh, column that you want to visualize, so in this case maybe I want to look at category name again, and then I might want to change that then to be total extended amount. So now I'm looking at the categories by total amount sold. I can change the chart type if I like. So maybe I want to make this a line chart. And let's break that out. Then we can go in. Each of these charts can be configured. So I can add options, additional options to this. So maybe I want to split this out by region or some other value. So it gives me a nice little breakout there. And I can limit the number of subgroups if I don't want to, you know, if I want the top 10 or top 5 or whatever, then I can just put that value in there, and it will only show me those five values. And then I can save that, that visual if I like. Again, to the, the visuals. If I choose, if I choose a, uh, a date field, then it's going to give me a trend chart. So I'm, I usually like something like a spline or a line chart for, for trend charts. And then let's change that interval to be a quarter. So we can kind of trend sales over the quarter. So let's add, make that extended amount. I'm just going to go back and change that. And that, there we go. So now we see the the trend over time in dollars. And then again, I can change the series if I want to break that out, or I can go in and configure it and add multiple series here, or I can split it out again by region. So now this is a nice little trend chart by quarter here of each region. can 
save that to the visuals. If I choose uh, some sort of geographical sounding name, well, in this case, I don't have one, I don't think, or well, I have postal code, but uh, if it were something like state or country uh, in the name, it would give me a map uh, of that, that data. So that's you know some of the visuals that you can create just very quickly there. Under the visuals, then you can see the ones that have been saved. And then you can also create, if you wanted to, you could create the visuals manually by selecting the appropriate uh, visual type and then going in and configuring that chart accordingly. And then from there, I could take this data set and any of the visuals that have been that have been saved to it and I can create those reports we talked about the dashboard comparison board and data view so I can create my dashboard report from that data set or the uh, comparison board and so forth reports we'll be talking about those next week showing you how to create those so I won't go into that today but you can then create your reports from that data set or data sets once you have the data populated, being able to update that data, because obviously, you know, we pull the data now and there, that data may be changing over a, a period of time, over some frequency. So you will want to update this data set at some point to get that data updated then in the data set itself. And you can do that here through the jobs tool. And that allows you to easily refresh the data and then you can also do things like send an email or FTP the data or you know, write it out to a file system if you like when the job gets ran. Then, but you can also set that to refresh this data set when it runs. And then you can schedule that to run on whatever frequency you would like it to run on. So I could do it every you know, 30 minutes, every two hours, every, every day. Uh, once a week or uh, twice a month or yearly or some custom schedule so you can refresh that data set whenever you need so that any of the visuals and any of the reports that are based on this data set will automatically update or show the most updated data when that content is rendered. You can export the data from a data set and be able to export to any of these formats, one of them being a save list. And then you would specify the name of the save list, Make sure you name it accordingly with the proper naming convention and then point to your unit, your U2 or unit data data source and then which field it is that you want to export. So you would choose, for example, the student ID. So that's how you'd create a save list and then you'd export that and it would create this, the uh, save list for you on that data source. Flip back here to my presentation. So that's just a little bit about how data sets work. I could spend a whole lot more time going into building the data sets, uh, the, you know, the, the nuances of creating a data set and, and the ad query editor and the things you can do in the, the editor and, and so forth. But in the interest of time, I'm, I'm um, not able to do that today, but we are uh, going to be talking more about that at our conference. So be sure to register for that. Uh, it's in February 2019, and uh, we'll, we'll be having several sessions that go over that and talk about data sets and data sources and all sorts of Informer 5 topics and interesting and fun stuff. Now let's talk a little bit about some things about architecting data sets. And I know I've, I've spoken with a lot of, of customers about data sets, and, and a, a lot of folks tend to want to think very big and very broad uh, in terms of data sets, which, you know, I kind of started thinking that way myself. But, you know, as I've thought about it over time, really, I, I think it's best just to simply start out simple. Build a basic data set, something that, that you need, that, uh, that has data in it that you need, that you can use right away, and start using that and play around with the, the visuals and work with the how you can interact with it and create some reports off of the data set. You can always go back and very easily add to that data set whenever you like. If you need to add another data column uh, in there, if you need to manipulate a calculation or whatever, you can very easily go back in and do that. And so as I was saying, start simple. Build a basic data set. Start with something that you know you need right now. It doesn't have to be the perfect data set. You can always go back and extend it and expand upon it later on. But, you know, go start off with a basic data set and then build from there.
And another way that you can go about architecting your data sets too is looking at your existing Informer 4 reports. And you know, you're looking at, at categories of reports. So maybe I'm looking at, uh, if you're in higher education, maybe you look at your uh, student enrollment reports that are being ran, uh, or maybe you look at your sales reports, or your uh, if you're in, say, insurance, if you're looking at your policies reports. Look at those and see what are some common data elements that are being pulled and being used regularly, and that, that would be a good starting point for a data set. Again, it doesn't have to be detailed, exact, and, and perfect to start, but it's, it's a good place to, to get started with using data sets and being able to, to utilize those then for that, those analysis tools that we have. And I, I wanted to reiterate this. I covered this in our last session, talking about the differences in data sets and ad hoc queries. And I want to kind of reiterate this and bring it up again, just in case you weren't here last week. You're not required to use data sets, but if you're going to use those reports that we talked about, the dashboards, comparison boards, and data grids that we'll see next week, those do require data sets. To populate those. Just some things to think about when you're when you're working with data sets. Do I have to use a data set or can I just use ad hoc queries? You can certainly use ad hoc queries if you're just pulling lists of things. But some things to keep in mind about the, the what's different between the two. A data set, the query only has to run when the data is refreshed. So if I'm needing a list of, of sales orders or if I'm needing a list of enrolled students, and five other people are needing that saved data. With a data set, I don't have to run that query in order to get the data. That query's already been ran and it, the data exists in the data set itself. So I'm accessing the data at that point. I already have it populated, so I can go ahead and start doing what I need to do. With an ad hoc query, I have to run the query and those other five people that need that same data also have to run that query to get the information they need. And so I have to wait on the query to finish and then I can go about what I need to do with that data. With a data set, when the data comes back, that data gets indexed and persisted in Informer. So it's it's there, I can access it whenever I need to. With the ad hoc queries, again, the data is temporary, so I have to run that query the next time I need that data. So every time I need it, I've got to hit my database and query it, as well as those other five or 10 or however other many people that need that data. So I'm adding some extra load on my database by using the ad hoc query approach, uh, since I have to query every, every person that needs that data has to run that query. And with, with the data set, since the data is persisted, it allows me uh, access to all of the discover features, the visuals, and the reports uh, that go along with data sets. Whereas with ad hoc queries, because the data is temporary, I have very limited discover and visual capabilities with that data. So there, there's, I can't do as much with the data in a, from an ad hoc query as I could with a data set. And data sets are really, uh, allows you to work with larger volume of data. So if I'm wanting to say, do some comparisons over time of admissions at my institution, educational institution or sales or insurance policies or equipment rentals or whatever, I can pull larger volumes of data into a data set because I'm not always having to query that database to get the data. I can pull that broader spectrum of data over time into that data set and be able to do my analysis much more quickly than I could with an ad hoc query. So those ad hoc queries are really designed to handle smaller volumes of data just for that purpose because of the, the load that it adds to the database and, and the overhead that's involved. And because the, I'm accessing with a data set, I'm always accessing the data, I'm, I'm adding a layer of data integrity there because I'm, I'm not worrying about the timing of when I run this query versus somebody else running it. And now all of a sudden we're in a meeting and I've got one result, they have a different result, or maybe they ran a different query than I did and uh, went about uh, querying the data differently, so they get different results. So now we're unsure of the data at this point. We, we don't know that we can trust the data because it doesn't match. Whereas with the data set, we're both accessing the data that has already been queried and been verified and vetted before we had access to it, so then we know and can trust the data at that point. So that's just some 
things to think about there when when you're comparing data sets to ad hoc queries. Again, if you want to use ad hoc queries, you certainly can. Uh, we're not saying you can't use those or shouldn't use those, but just some things to keep in mind when thinking about one versus the other. Uh, our conference will be having much more in-depth sessions on, on data sets and other parts of Informer 5, so please uh, be sure to attend that uh, to get more and further information. And of course, we're always here in the support uh, area to answer any questions you may have as well. Speaking of questions, then, first technical question, I guess, here, are there any restrictions on the data set designer for only retrieving values with non-null value, like only get data column that actually has a date? Yes, that is actually uh, where you would use your criteria. So if I go back here real quick, let me just jump in and so I can come in here and I can add a criteria that just simply says where, let's say I only want to see the orders that have a ship date. So I could say where ship date is not null. So that would add that criteria and that would make sure that I'm only getting orders in this case with a ship date associated with them. I see the native SQL option for data sets. We are running Illusion Colleague on Unidata as opposed to SQL. Can we write direct queries using Unidata's UniQuery? Uh, you can do that. Uh, it's just a slightly different approach. Uh, you still use the data set designer for that. Uh, but what you can do with that then, let's see, let me get my Unidata data source up here. So what you can do there in the criteria is actually uh, use the TCL ECL block option here and then I can do any sort of select list operation here in these TCL ECL commands. So I could do select, I could do a get list, I could do a merge list, I could, you know, anything that, that works with a list. I can even call subroutines for that matter uh, if you need to, but uh, typically these would be simple selects. Now you're not going to be doing the list statement. Informer generates that for you, but the the actual select criteria you could uh, write just in native. So I could say you know select uh, HR per with uh, HRP effect term date not equal to null. You know something like that. So I could actually write those select statements directly in there if I wanted to. So it's it's not as as raw as native SQL but it does provide you that option. Uh, can prompts be added to native SQL queries? Yes, they can. Prompts are now called inputs, so we can actually create one of those. Let me go to my native SQL example here. And I can create an input for, let's say, a date picker. And this would be my ship date. Select ship date. And then I can go into my query and say where, uh, let's see, o dot shipped date equals, and then I can choose my input there. Structure that correctly. And then you get the prompt for it. You can enter the date, and then it will sub, it will substitute that input then for the uh, the value that you enter there for that input. Uh, so those, that's still there. It's just formatted a little differently than it was in version four. Uh, can we create a data set from multiple sources such as Excel and SQL? There's several ways you can approach that. One of the things I didn't show. Uh, was the ability to create what are called workspaces. And workspaces allows you to create your own little database within the Informer Postgres uh, database itself and upload spreadsheets into that workspace. So I can, for example, go into uh, here and upload data into this workspace. I can pull in multiple spreadsheets and those spreadsheets become independent tables within that data source, and I can link them. They become like a SQL data source. And then at that point, I could link to them using a, a typical remote link, 
to be able to link data between those two disparate data sources. You can also, within the data set construct, within the, the definition of the data set, you can use a, a flow step that pulls data from another data set. So you could have a SQL-based data set and, a, and an Excel-based data set and be able to link those two together through this flow step, or here's where you could actually do that remote link and pull the data in from, say, a workspace or something like that. So you could actually meld data from Excel and SQL and Unidata and any number of other different types of data sources together into one data set. How do I schedule a saved list? I have a job that emails an Excel file and I want from a data set and also want to be able to create a saved list similar the way you do it in four. That is a feature that we're, we're working on adding back into five. Uh, right now, that's not a part of the, the jobs options, uh, but that request is in the hopper to, to look at. So we'll, we'll be taking a look at that to, uh, at some point to add that feature to, to five. Okay, let's see. Currently, we have Informer accessing a large data warehouse. Sounds like a data set is basically storing data in two places now. Should we be concerned about the size of the data set, example number of records? With, with this version, one of the beautiful things about it is that it can handle very large data sets. So I don't know if I have one here. Let me see if I have that one loaded in my instance. So here I have a data set that, now this is, this would be relatively small, actually, but this is on my little small laptop that I have that I'm running on right now. So this is not even on a configured server. Uh, this is a data set that has half a million rows of, of data in it. So it's from my laptop, I would say it's probably a pretty large data set. So we have had customers that have pulled um, upwards of, of 8, 10, 20 million rows of data into their informer. Now, granted, you're going to need to make sure your Informer 5 server is properly configured to handle that, but it can definitely handle it. And uh, like I said here, because of the way we're indexing the data and, and handling the data, I can very easily work with this and, you know, sorting data. I'm My laptop sorting half a million rows of data there uh, very easily, and I can group. I, I would not dare do this in Informer 4. So I just grouped half a million rows of data right there. So it's very fast and efficient. As long as you have your Informer 5 server uh, properly configured, it should be able to handle the pretty much any size data set. Uh, let's see. When setting up a job to refresh a data set, is it always a full wipe and reload, or is there a way to refresh incrementally for only new changed rows? Uh, right now, it's there, there. You have two options: you either completely replace the data set, or you append to the data set. The difficulty is uh, trying to figure out the incremental changes. What has changed? So that's uh, something that we're we're working on adding. It's it's a feature that we're we're trying to figure out a good, good approach for. So as easy as it sounds, when you actually get into coding it, it's a little more difficult. Uh, I understand about data sets. My question is, my users are always wanting live data. How do I explain to them that this is not really live data? One of the things that I always try to explain is that uh, a couple of things there. One, nine times out of 10, users don't really, really need live data, regardless of what they say, regardless of what they tell you. Been there, done that. As a colleague administrator, I can I can tell you they, they really don't need it. Even though you think you're getting live data, you're not. There's always a latency involved. So if a report takes two minutes to run in Informer 4, that data that they're looking at is two minutes old. So there's two minute, a two-minute latency there. Data could have changed in that period of time. If it takes 20 minutes to run, obviously that's, you know, 20 minutes latency. So they're, they're never really looking at live data, truly. Depending on the data they're looking at, it can be rather dangerous to be looking at the data at any point in time, and and Chris, I know you're with, with uh, one of the community colleges here. I'll, I'll give you an example of uh, a discussion I had with uh, another school one time about this, where how he how the uh, administrator there explained it to to their president and some of their folks. If you're looking at, for example, say enrollment data, and you know everybody's always 
paranoid about what, what are the enrollment numbers now? As you look at enrollment through the day, it's it's cyclical. It's up and down and up and down and up and down. So depending on where you look at that data, you may either be uh, having a party or you may be having a panic attack, one of the two. So ideally, you want to look at, decide on a point in time when you're going to say, this is what we consider the data and point to that point in time and say, that is that is it. Now, there are cases where, for example, if you're running, uh, if you're doing uh, like job process uh, somewhere like you're doing a payroll run, where you need to look at what is the data in the file right now, obviously that's different. You're going to want to run ad hoc on that. But nine times out of 10, users can sacrifice a little bit of latency for the data in order to gain the efficiencies that they get with being able to work with work with the data, reduce the load on your database server, and ensure that everything that the data you're looking at is valid and correct. You know, again, going back to that example with enrollment, where if you ran an enrollment number enrollment report right now, and then 20 minutes later somebody else ran another one, you both go to a cabinet meeting. Uh, if the numbers are different, then you're going to end up in this big argument about, well, what, what's my enrollment? Or if you're in sales, what are my sales right now? There's some drawbacks in looking at what you call live data. Uh, so that's kind of my approach to it. Can you prevent users from refreshing data set? Okay, so that kind of goes into security a little bit about what access users have. If the user is on the team that owns the data set, then they have to be a certain role within that team in order to refresh it. Otherwise, they'll have to wait on the, the job to, to do the refreshing. If the data set is shared to a team, they can't refresh it at all. Uh, they have no ability to refresh. The users in a certain role on the owning team are capable of refreshing that data set. You said advantage of data sets is a larger volume of data that you can add to over time. So what is the difference between data set and a data warehouse? Technically, there's really not much difference there uh, because you're, you're basically modeling a warehouse of data in Informer 5. Uh, just an Informer 5 becomes its own data warehouse. There's no, there's no need to have a separate one. You can have one, obviously. And the other difference is that with Informer 5, it, the data is indexed. Everything in the data set is indexed. So you're able to do the, the grouping and analysis and aggregation and comparisons and all of that much more quickly than you would if you had to wait on a query from a data warehouse to extract and do its thing and then do the comparison. So it just it operates a lot faster in most cases. Can I create pivot tables and perform tabulations of total quantities from an existing data set? Example data for iPads, National Clearinghouse, et cetera, et cetera, total by student gender, total by ethnicity, total by program. You can create those those pivot tables uh, any way you want. So if I go over, let me pull up a, uh, an educational one just so you kind of get an idea. So you could actually come in here. So by gender, for example, if I wanted to create my pivot table by gender, and then with columns broken out by ethnicity, and then there's my count. Uh, obviously, I not, don't have a lot of data in there, so it would uh, not getting a whole lot of information in there. But that, that's how you could very easily create those pivot tables. So it really doesn't matter, you know, what you're using there. You can break these pivot tables out any way you like. Can you create a data set from a stored procedure? That capability is coming soon, where our developers are working on adding stored procedure uh, support to Informer. So that will be. Uh, coming out in a, a future release. I can't say when exactly, but it will be soon. Another question, can I freeze or lock a data set? How is that done? Right now, there's not a way of, of uh, locking a, a data set uh, or freezing it in, in the way you're explaining it there. Uh, the only way you would do that is simply not refreshing it. Uh, that would that would prevent it from changing, obviously. But that, again, is something that has been requested that is in the development hopper to, to look at. How would one choose to create visuals on the data set or define it as a report as both seems can do the same job? So when you're in the data set, you can create the visuals here under Discover. And then when you save those visuals, they actually get saved to the data set here under the visuals area, and you see this one has a whole bunch of visuals that I've created over time. So you can 
create those there. You can uh, create those manually as well. So you can come in and choose, I want to create a pie chart and then go in and configure that manually. So that's how you would do that. Then in a report, and we'll see next week how you can add those uh, visuals then to a report to create a dashboard or a comparison board or any of the other types of, of reports there. If you use data set like a data warehouse, are there abilities to restore data set if inadvertently append to the data uh, set that shouldn't have occurred? Can you have a backup of them to restore if ever needed? That would be, uh, you just back up the, the indexing service on that and then just restore the, the indexing service. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know that there would be a way of restoring just a particular data set. Uh, I don't think we have that capability right now, but you would just have to do a full restore of the indexing service to get that back. Uh, that's a good, good point. That might be something we probably need to think about down the road. You mentioned creating a data set from stored procedures. What is a stored procedure? A stored procedure is a process that's ran on the database to return data similar to a, a query, but it has that has, it has more capability of business logic built into it. Uh, so that would be how you'd do that. Can visuals be added to a public site similar to dashboards in I4? Yes, visuals can be accessed externally to Informer 5 without having to put them on a dashboard. Uh, in Informer 4, you had to create a dashboard and then make the dashboard, the entire dashboard, accessible externally. So if I want to render this pie chart dynamically on a website, for example, I can, here under the Actions, generate an external link, and then I can uh, provide a, a direct link, or here's the embed option if I want to, here's, that gives me the image HTML tag that I want or that I need. And then I can copy that. And then whenever I access that image, Informer is going to render that image for me. So whatever the, uh, based on whatever the data is in the data set and render that within whatever page I'm on. So I'm able to uh, put those inside a portal or a web page or something like that and be able to access that visual. And again, they're dynamically generated. So this is, while it is static in that I can't interact with it, the Rendering is dynamic based on the uh, current pool of the data, whatever the most current data is in the data set. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us today. It's certainly been a pleasure to, to show you all about data sets and to talk to you about how you can use those. Certainly, if you have questions, feel free to email our support line, uh, i5support at intrinsic.com. So have a wonderful day, and we'll talk to you later.